It's rugged country. It's very, it's some of the ruggedest country in North America. My son's name is Dylan Redwine, yes. Yeah. And his dad texted me a little while ago and said he could not find Dylan. You know in the back of your mind that it's not going to end good. Bring Dylan home. Bring Dylan home. If you show us today, show where he's at today, I guarantee you I'll cut you loose. But Tom, I can't help you with that because I don't know where Dylan's at. I want everybody to know how much I love that boy. I want you to do something to find Dylan. I don't like you, I hate you, and you have been nothing of a father. I was horrified. The pictures are, you know, of Mark in women's clothing. Are the photos genuine? No, they are not. When I laid eyes on that skull, I just, I knew in my heart it was Dylan. Move back, okay? He uh, was, I think, shocked and surprised. He thought he was off the hook. I felt it was about damn time. Do you love your father? I still love him. I, I, I wish I didn't have to be here. This is what he's going to tell you. Situation. And I grabbed the gun. He's trying to no. find the first place to put a body. No, sir. The only thing they could do was kill him. You want to say anything? Leave the jury and find the defendant. Hi, my name is Elaine Redwine, and um, my son Dylan Redwine was visiting his dad up in Durango, and his dad texted me a little while ago and said he could not find Dylan. Okay. Dylan is thir 13 years old. Okay, so he's staying with his dad. And what's the dad's name? Mark. Mark Redwine. Um, does he have any idea where he may have gone? Uh, not according to him, no. And I was very scared for my son. I mean, my son wasn't even there for 24 hours and he's missing. I mean, that doesn't happen. I just got in my car and had to go to Durango because I live six hours away and try and find my son. It's rugged country. It's very, it's some of the ruggedest country in North America. And my concern was the, the, the weather for the, that night was supposed to go below freezing. I wound up being out till 12.30, 1 o'clock that night. And one of the notable f things that I saw is that uh, Mark never came out, never talked to me. And he wound up turning all the lights off in his house and, like he went to bed, which is very unusual. Usually somebody would light up the house like a beacon. So what we'll do is uh, we'll give you up. Within days, hundreds of people had volunteered to help search for Dylan Redwine. Some people for the terrain up the hill, some for between the lake and the road. Dylan's father, Mark, pushed for the search to center on the area around a mountain lake dam about seven miles away. He described Dylan as a big fisherman that he loved to go fishing all the time. He said that um, he couldn't find his fishing pole and that the fishing pole was missing and that he liked to go fishing down by the dam. And we're walking along the edges of this road, trying to find possibly Dylan's backpack. Volunteer Kathy Berry recorded the search around the dam for a Facebook page dedicated to Dylan. The terrain was really steep. Um, the road along the lake, it just drops straight down on the side and goes down into the water, down onto the bank. Dylan's mom is in front of me, and she's doing pretty good. She's holding it together pretty good. And you always fear the worst because he's not there, but we always tried to keep hope because I felt if I lost hope, you know, then everybody else would as well. Um, but you know, as a mom, you know in the back of your mind that it's not gonna end good. And you guys are friends of Dylan's, right? Yes. Yeah. Right. And Ryan, you were the last person to talk to Dylan on Sunday night, right? Yes. 
And so tell me what was going on. You guys were just texting and... Yeah. Uh, he sounded really excited to come over. He was actually supposed to stay the night, but decided not to for some reason. I don't know why. And then we decided that he would just come over at 6.30 in the morning. That's just what he asked. And I, I said that was fine. And so I set an alarm and I woke up in time and he never showed up. So anything else you guys want to say about your friend Dylan? Hope he comes home soon. Yeah, hope he comes home soon. People would come out, ask what they could do. Did you check here? Did you check here? Where a kid might be? Nothing. Loving God, we pray first and most of all for Dylan. We know that you are aware of where he is and what his needs are. And so we pray for him now. When I think of the word Dylan, the first thing that comes to my mind is perfect. And for this to happen to him is just horrible because he doesn't deserve it. Dylan's father, Mark, spoke about his son in the past tense. I want everybody to know how much I love that boy and how much I cared about him. He was such a wonderful boy. He meant everything. And unfortunately, his mom and I don't see eye to eye on things. And I wish that could change. I asked him, I said, did you and Dylan get into a fight? And he said, no. And I said, well, Dylan wouldn't just leave or run away without either texting me or Corey. The first thing I told Mark, you know, is this is your responsibility and we gotta, we gotta find him. Um, what'd you do with Dylan? Soon, sheriff's deputies and the FBI were asking Mark Redwine the same question and the family blame game escalated. Obviously, it's no secret that I, I believe that Lane could be involved in this. You know, I don't know how she would do it. I don't know who else she would have involved with it, but I can't help but think that there's a possibility that she had some involvement with this. He had some really bad answers at the end of the first interview uh, because he blamed Elaine, uh, Dylan's mom, for, his dis for Dylan's disappearance and said it's probably her fault and he thought that Dylan had just run away because of problems with Elaine. Dylan had flown into Durango to spend the Thanksgiving week with his father as part of a court-ordered visitation. He did not want to go. I mean, he was okay going um, because he wanted to see his friends in that area. But my mom was pretty sick with cancer and we knew it would probably be her last Thanksgiving and Dylan really wanted to spend it with my mom. I called my lawyer and, you know, said, what can I do? And she said, really nothing. It's a court order. You know, you really need to put him on the plane. It did not appear that this was a happy reunion. Um, even in the airport, when Dylan first got off the plane, there was no smiles, there were no hugs. The first stop was a Walmart to buy some movie DVDs. You know, in the cameras in the Walmart, Dylan and Mark are not together, shopping together. Dylan is texting the friend he had wanted to spend the night with, Ryan. So Dylan's already asserting himself to say he's there on a mandated visit, but he doesn't want to spend time with Dad. The last time Dylan was seen alive was after he and his father left the Walmart, stopped for a hamburger, and headed to Mark's home. Uh, as Mark describes it, they're not real warm towards each other at first, but they start roughhousing. You know, I asked a couple times, was, was anybody hurt in this thing? And no, no, nobody's hurt. At 9.46 that night, Dylan's phone stopped working. Two months after Dylan disappeared, his mother Elaine and brother Corey joined a protest outside Mark Redwine's home. Our buddy, our heart. Where is Dylan? Our buddy, our heart. Corey's getting ready to do another interview. Well, right now, no, um, he was the last person to see him, and he's not, you know, helping out with 
you know, um, giving us answers that we have questions to. And so until we can put all of the attention back on Dylan, we got to get it off the last person to see Dylan. And right now, I'm, he's making it as hard as he can to get the attention off of him. There's still a lot of doubt in me that he didn't have anything to do with it. Do you think he did have something to do with it? I do. With the FBI's help, Sheriff's deputies carried out a search warrant on Mark Redwine's house. His eyes were bloodshot, but it didn't seem like he was crying. To me, it looked staged, uh, as like he was looking like he was emotional. The cadaver dogs uh, alerted to human remains, um, the odor of human re remains within Mark's, Mark Redwine's house and the back of his uh, pickup. We knew something had likely happened in the house. When he said the rough housing, no one was hurt, our thoughts were something else had happened and that the rough housing was explaining something else. And, and to move forward was to take the polygraph. And Sheriff's investigator Tom Cowing pressed Redwine to come clean after delivering the results of a lie detector test. You've taken it once, Elaine took it once, she passed it, and you failed it. He was found to be deceptive, uh, specifically to the question of, do you know where Dylan Redwine is? And he failed miserably. If you lead us to him, I absolutely guarantee you that I would not arrest you today. If you told me where Dylan is today, and you take me to Dylan, Show me where he's at. We'll drop you back off at your car at your house, and we get Dylan back. And you go on with your life. Because what's more important is we want him back home. I want that. If you show us today, show, show where he's at today, just bring us there. I guarantee you, I'll cut you loose. I'm not going to arrest you today. But Tom, I can't help you with that because I don't know where Dylan's at. And I think you do. I know you do. If he fell down accidentally and hurt himself and you freaked out and panicked and you put him somewhere. You know, um, it's, it's better to get in, in front of this than to have somebody down the road find him and then, oh, sh what do we do now? Well, he's in a shallow grave. This doesn't look good. Last seen by dad. Or you can just tell us where he's at and work, work with us and we'll deal with all the, the other stuff later. I'm not gonna sit here and admit to you that I've done something that didn't happen, that I didn't do. And if that's what you're waiting on, then we're gonna be waiting a long time for that. I got all the time in the world. I just, when's enough? Enough? When, when, I mean, when's it going to be too much for you to hide? And Mark Redwine had a lot to hide, as investigators would learn from his other son, Corey. We were in Cleveland. We were on a, a trip with Mark. Um, we were, you know, went to, I believe, a baseball game that day. Mark was asleep. Late at night in the hotel room. Dylan had borrowed his father's computer. Corey, Corey, come here. I got to show you these pictures. We came across a deleted file. Um, it showed all the pictures that had recently been deleted. I was horrified. The pictures are, you know, of Mark in women's clothing. You know, I think he's got a red shirt on, um, wearing women's pantyhose and underwear, um, you know, and relieves himself in his diaper and you know he cleans it you know with his mouth and that's when I pulled out my cell phone um, and just took a few few pictures of, of what was on the laptop. It's a place my mind never dreamed of you know going let alone seeing it you know in my own father you know so um, it you know it, it's it's a terrible thing I'll have in my mind forever. I told Dylan after we, we saw the pictures, you know, you, we gotta keep this between me and you. I didn't want Mark knowing that we had those pictures and we knew about it. 
But 13-year-old Dylan, as sweet as everyone said he was, never held back if something bothered him. He didn't like to be quieted, so if he, if he felt a certain way, he would make sure that you knew how he felt. He was just honest and to the point. They had gotten into an argument about me and my mom being a good example for Dylan, and Dylan wanted those pictures to show Mark, you know, what we had seen him as. I could feel the frustration and the the fire through, you know, of in Dylan. Um, so I knew he was really upset, and I ended up sending those pictures to Mark after Dylan had asked for him. I wish I wouldn't have sent them at all. That's, that's Dylan trying to get some power so he can go up against Dad, like he had seen his older brother do. And so we believe that's what happened, and Dylan has that, that uh, as he would call, weapon against Mark, uh, and it's a pretty good one. Pretty great. Take. This is going to be a changing day in your life. But with Dylan still missing, Mark's secret was about to become very public and become a key part of the investigation as a likely motive. Elaine, Corey, and Mark Redwine all agreed to appear on the Dr. Phil show, holding nothing back. I don't like you, I hate you, and you have been nothing of a father. I want you to do something to find Dylan. Dylan is everything to me. My whole world evolves around Dylan. Are the photos genuine? No, they are not. So that's not you in the photos? No, I'm not arguing that it's my face in the photos. What I'm arguing is the fact that they were fabricated because it was actually, I believe that Elaine and Corey were coming into my house and rummaging through my things and going through my personal belongings when I traveled out of town. I came up with a scheme that had to be so outrageous that they could not, not talk about it. And that's exactly what I got out of that. Did I in ever intend to be sitting here on your show having this conversation with you? or them? Absolutely not. So you're what saying you they broke into that. your house and fabricated these pictures? No, 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 no. I fabricated the pictures and left them available. I never let on to anyone, but I think that's when I knew that Dylan was no longer alive. Just by Mark's remarks and his body language and his actions, um, it made me fear the worst. This is a really serious, serious matter. Among the millions of people who watch the Redwine family on Dr. Phil's program. Thank you for being here today. So long. Were the authorities back in Colorado who obtained the videos as possible evidence. It brought Mark forward um, and, and put him um, at the center of, uh, of the controversy. So what were your thoughts on that whole thing? I think it was a public format for Elaine and Corey to publicly accuse me of doing something with Dylan. And I, I expected too much from Dr. Phil. The Dr. Phil show resulted in hundreds of leads and tips, but none panned out. I mean, everything leads back to you, Mark. I mean, we have systematically ruled out a ton of people. You say, Everything that you do in life is, is for Dylan. Everything you want it to be right for Dylan. Just take us to him and cut you loose. That's what I want to. No one to you it probably doesn't seem that way. But... Actions speak louder than words, Mark. I don't think you're a, a, a guy who has a mean bone in his body that will purposely do something like that. But, you know, if it was an accident, um, you know, we can work with that. You can't undo something that has gone horribly wrong, but you can make amends for something that's been wrong. You can always ask for forgiveness. All right, well, I'll take that all into consideration. They didn't have that smoking gun. There was not enough information. We didn't, you know, you don't, go forward on a criminal investigation with no body. And I think it was very difficult for people to believe that a father could kill his son. You know, I mean, fathers don't just kill their sons. The winter weather had shut down much of the search effort for Dylan. 
Once snow hits the high country, you, you, you can't get up there. Nothing, nothing all winter. Especially on Middle Mountain where we wanted to search, they close the mountain in the winter, so you can't even get up there. But once the snow melted, the searchers were finally able to access the Middle Mountain area. Um, my stepfather caught him up on the mountain early one morning. And I got the call that uh, Mark was just sighted coming off Middle Mountain Road. And that's what turned our attention to Middle Mountain Road. Uh, 35 handler, dog handlers, numerous dogs. We had ATV searchers, we had horseback searchers, we had uh, rappelling teams come in. It was a, a four day search. Uh, it was um, during that search that a Nike Air Jordan size 7 youth was found. That was the breakthrough. The shoe appearing to match the one Dylan was seen wearing in the Walmart surveillance video. Uh, the next day uh, we had the, the search dogs, the human remain dogs in that area. They uh, one dog alerted on two bones. While those two bones were being collected, I looked down and found a long bone. The bones were Dylan's. This is investigator Tanya Galbright. This is a phone call to Mark Redwine. This is Mark. Hey Mark, it's Tanya. Hi, how are you? I'm wonderful, how are you? Oh, I'm f***ing living the dr f***ing dream, the f***ing dream. Are you intoxicated, Mark? Nope, not at all. Okay, then why are you talking to me like that? Because, because you can't seem to think no deeper than the surface. Uh, he told me to pull my head out of the sociopath's ass and that women are only good for one thing, and it's not cooking and cleaning. Because I'll be honest with you, Tanya, I don't think you're capable of handling a situation. Really? Like don't that. you think it's pretty amazing we found any remains up on Middle Mountain? In the middle of nowhere? You know, 2% of Dylan's remains does not constitute him being found, so you know what? Yes, it does. He's dead. We know that now. If we hadn't gone up there and looked, we wouldn't have known that. So 2% of Dylan's remains constitutes him being found. I'd like to find the rest of him, but yes, oh, we know, you know what, what happened. We know he's you know no what? longer with us. But there was still no skull, no cranium, which would likely hold the clues to Dylan's cause of death. Mark made a comment to me several times about how there had only been 2% of Dylan's remains found so they can never prove he was murdered. But other bits and pieces of the investigative puzzle began to fall into place. Mark said that he, when he was moving his four-wheeler out of the garage, uh, he found the fishing pole in the garage, uh, which is impossible. It had been searched and photographed, and I don't know where it came from, but it was back. The futile search around the lake and the dam had all been based on the supposedly missing fishing pole. The fact that he had tried to use this ploy uh, and then was foolish enough to say that he had found it, you know, just indicated that he was being very dishonest with law enforcement. And then in 2015, almost three years after Dylan disappeared, hikers found a skull about a mile away six miles by road from where the other bones had been located. When I laid eyes on that skull, I just, I knew in my heart it was Dylan. There was no question, I had no question about it. And that was in 15, I thought, okay, now we're gonna move forward. And again, we still didn't move forward. Um, so in 2017, a lot of stuff changed in La Plata County. The election that year brought a new district attorney Christian Champagne, who had been working on the case as a deputy district attorney. The new DA just pressed forward and said, you know, we're going to get a grand jury and let's see what a grand jury says. And I just told them to stick with us. It was going to be a long road. It was going to take a while, but that we were going to get to justice for Dylan. 
The grand jury returned an indictment of red wine for second degree murder and child abuse. Just keep your hands up. Don't move, bud, okay? Mark was in Washington State working as a trucker when the indictment came down. Do not move. He uh, was, I think, shocked and surprised. Uh, a warrant for murder second for you. I'm sorry? I have no idea what that's about. He had become pretty confident that we were never going to bring charges against him, that we had never developed any evidence against him. So he thought he was off the hook. I felt it was about damn time. We are live in Colorado where the case is about to proceed against Mark Redwine in the second degree murder case in the death of his 13 year old son, Dylan. Redwine did not face the more serious first degree murder charge, which carries a mandatory life sentence. Here in Colorado, first degree murder requires plan or premeditation ahead of time. We did not have evidence that he plotted to, to kill Dylan. Uh, so second degree murder and child abuse resulting in death were the right charges for our case. It had been almost nine years since Dylan had disappeared, but for his mother, Elaine, it seemed like yesterday. Spend a couple minutes telling the jury about it, okay? Dylan was sweet, he was funny, um, he was charismatic, he was um, very empathetic, he really cared about people and their feelings. Um, very sweet, sweet boy. I miss all. There's tissues to the left if you need them. You have water with you. He marked red wine in the courtroom here today. Yes. He's wearing a blue shirt and gray suit. There was plenty of eye contact, and I am not afraid of him anymore. And so I refuse to look away. So I'm showing you what's been previously made into evidence of people's one, two, and three. Can you take a look at those, please? I've seen those a million times. What are those? <laughs> They're pictures of Dylan, his friend, Adam and Joe. Taken the day before he left to visit his father. Do you any injuries, sores, or cuts to his face or lips? No. And then her final unanswered text messages to Dylan. <sighs> How's it going, son? Are you okay? All right, uh, Ms. Hall, I know this is, I can only imagine how hard this is. I'm really sorry. Thank you. In the final text message in this exhibit, what do you say in that text message, Ms. Hall? I said, Dylan, please be safe. Mom is here to come get you, son. Elaine had been unrelenting in her efforts to point a finger of blame at her ex-husband. You were the last person to see Dylan. That's been confirmed. And that became a defense line of attack on cross-examination. I've always said that I believe that he had a hand in Dylan's disappearance, yes. Okay, and you've told that to a lot of people. Okay, sure. I mean... You don't have to go anymore. They know your answer. You've gone on national television and iterated that opinion, correct? Yes. And you've iterated that opinion to law enforcement, correct? Yes. And you've iterated that opinion to um, Facebook platforms, correct? Yes. Do you recall making any comments on the Facebook page, arrest Mark Redwine? No. Do you recall making any comments on arrest in prison Mark Redwine Facebook page? No. You know, you're talking about the grieving mother uh, of, of a lost child, a murdered child, uh, and to try to attack her and trash her character um, and say that she was, you know, making this uh, about a vendetta or revenge against Mark, I think really fell flat. Now the jurors were about to see the compromising photos of Mark Redwine. And we showed them for a very specific and limited purpose, which is to show that there was conflict and a potential motive um, for, for Mark to lash out against Dylan, um, for Dylan to have confronted his father with these photographs, and that that would have been an example of uh, 
some of the conflict that could have led to Mark lashing out. Could you please start by introducing yourself to the jury by your full name, Corey Allen Redwine? Was there a point in time when Dylan used the defendant's computer? Yes. Did he find something on the computer? Yes. Can you explain to the jury what he found? Um, he found pictures of Mark dressed in women's clothing, um, wearing a diaper, um, taking selfies of him, wearing the clothing, um, wearing the diaper, um, eating the feces that was in the diaper, um, and uh, just, that's pretty much it. How did he react to seeing those photographs of his father? Um, he was pretty disgusted. Dylan lost uh, uh, um, any reasons for him to look up to, to Mark that day. And then prosecutors showed the jury a clip from the Dr. Phil show. You're what saying they broke into that? your house and fabricated these pictures? No, 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 no. I fabricated the pictures and left them available. So is there any reason back then for him to plant photos like that for you or for Dylan? No. Do you love your father? Yes. Do you wish you were here under different circumstances seeing your father? Yes. To this very day, how do you feel about him? I still love him. I... I... I wish I didn't have to be here. Not all jurors would believe that's a motive for murder, a motive to kill your own child if they see a picture of you cross-dressing on a computer. That is gonna be a hard sell if, well, if that were all there was. And the jury wants to see hard evidence that this man killed his son. So the prosecution actually recreated Mark Redwine's living room in a courtroom down the hall and brought the jury in. They could see the layout, they could see the distances, uh, and they could see the actual pieces of evidence um, with their own eyes. There was blood on the couches, there was blood on the floor, there was blood on the coffee table. And at least one of the deposits was 100% Dylan Redwine's blood. That was probably some of our strongest evidence. And that area was right in here for this day. But Dylan was a frequent visitor to his father's home, and the prosecution witnesses could not say when the blood had been left there, or that it meant a crime had been committed. Having been to over 1,000 crime scenes, you know how to find evidence of violent struggles and fights, correct? If it's present, yes. And in your initial walkthrough, I want to focus your attention on that, you didn't find any evidence of a violent struggle or a fight or bloodletting event in your initial walkthrough, correct? That is correct. This is a model of a human skull. The final days of the trial focused on who or what killed Dylan Redwine. The significance is that I believe that this is associated with blunt trauma. But the defense focused on the fact the skull was found in an area where bears and mountain lions roam freely. It obviously, some sort of sizable animal bit, left puncture marks on that part of the cranium. Coyote, fox, bear, mountain lion. Um, yes. You can't rule out that this fracture comes from either a bear getting really after the, the cranium and biting down on it and crunching on it. Right. So we knew that they wanted to make that the center of their case and the center of their attack on us. And that an animal or something caused in nature could have been responsible for the fractures on the skull. You know, we have bear, we have mountain lion, uh, but the, generally they don't move their prey more than about a quarter of a mile. Dylan's skull was found more than a mile away from his other remains. It's possible that a bear could carry a skull that far too physically, right? Yes. And it's possible that a mountain lion could carry a skull that far physically, right? Uh, physically, yes. Have you ever seen anything like that in your career? Uh, bears and lions, no. They were never able to put together the pieces to make a plausible argument about how 
Dylan would have gotten up on this mountainside uh, in shorts and a t-shirt um, and been attacked by wild animals uh, in, in the middle of November. It just, didn't, it just didn't make sense. All eyes now were on Mark Redwine to see his reaction, to see if he would testify. The jurors, they're watching the defendant very, very closely to see what his reactions look like, to watch him as the witnesses are talking about Dylan's murder, Dylan's remains. I mean, a normal father that lost a son would have completely fallen to pieces and he never even reacted at all. He never shed a tear. Redwine opted not to testify. At its core, this is a simple and tragic case. A damaged and deteriorating relationship that turned deadly on November 18th, 2012. We know Dylan knows about the poop pics, as he calls them. I could show them to you, but you remember them, ladies and gentlemen. Think about the impact they had on his 13-year-old son. Do you think it would have taken much for Dylan to use them in November to bring them up, to talk about them? We know that Dylan's murder was not caused by an accident. We know Dylan's murder was not caused by a bear because of all the evidence that comes before and everything that he did after. And all it took was a spark for this man to end Dylan's life, ladies and gentlemen. When you're ready, Mr. Bogan. May it please the court. Redwine's lawyer, Justin Bogan, delivered the defense closing arguments. We stand shoulder to shoulder, Mr. Mark Redwine, because it's our honor to stand with someone who's wrongly accused. And the evidence is so thin, and the emotions are so hot. So we have a government case is based on the pictures. They introduce the pictures as evidence. They want you to believe that these pictures will provide some enlightenment to you about the motive that they ascribe to Mr. Redwine for killing his youngest son, whom he loved. Do not fall for that. The prosecution likes these pictures a lot more than they like the tangible and scientific evidence in this case. They like those pictures more than they like the fact that uncontested damage by animals to the remains. The marks on the cranium are consistent with animal damage. They are creating this narrative about rage and anger and photos and deteriorating relationship. And they want you to latch on to this story <laughs> because the actual physical evidence in the case does not support that Mark Redwine killed his son. The trial had lasted for five weeks. The jury returned its verdict in six hours. Mr. Redwine, would you please stand up? Jury verdict count number one, murder in the second degree. We, the jury, find the defendant, Mark Redwine, guilty of count number one. Be quiet, please. Count number two, child abuse. We, the jury, find the defendant, Mark Redwine, guilty of count two, child abuse. He knows what he did. He knows. I think he deserves to die. I mean, his son died, and I think he needs an equally horrible death. But there is no death penalty in Colorado, and the sentence for second-degree murder ranges from 16 to 48 years. The people would bring forward Elaine Hall. I'm really nervous, so it's okay. bear with me. Dylan was 13 years old when he took his life. When I think about what happened that night, it breaks my heart to think about Dylan looking up at his dad knowing he's the killer. He is my killer. It breaks my heart. And I wonder, what were you thinking then when you saw his big old blue eyes? I, I mean, I don't even think that it phased you. I'm just glad that we are free from you and that you will not be free to hurt us anymore. Thank you, Your Honor. 
Mark may have physically taken him, and I can't change that. But what I can do is tell the world how a 13-year-old young man stood up to his then 50-year-old father and said all the things I regret never saying. Dylan is my hero and became more of a man in 13 years than Mark has in 60. Do you wish to tell me anything before sentencing? No, Your Honor, I do not. But Redwine had expressed his thoughts on the trial in a statement to the probation office. You wrote the following, and this is a quote from what you wrote. Innocent of all charges, miscarriage of justice, fake conviction, sham trial. I have trouble remembering a convicted criminal defendant that has shown such an utter lack of remorse for his criminal behavior. The community needs to be uh, protected from you. You need to be removed from society for a long period of time. I'm going to sentence you to 48 years on both counts with five years of parole. They are to be served concurrently. Deputy Robinson, take the defendant back to jail. Thank you. I don't think closure is a real part of losing somebody personally. I can't move on from my son. I can't just close the chapter and pretend he never existed. So, I mean, I'll always be sad. I'll always mourn his death. Um, and I'll always celebrate his life. She and her family never gave up on trying to get justice for Dylan. Just in Colorado alone, there's 1,500 cold cases that have gone unsolved. And so the message that I want to send to those families, to those law enforcement officers that are working on these cases, and to the prosecutors that are considering whether to come forward into court and bring these charges, is to keep fighting and never give up.